So, Dogate, Andrea Ker Yenishe, Adonne E, Nishinigi E, Inde Nishe, Irish Bashachin, Inde Dashache, German Dashanalia, Kote Go E, Tishli E, Portland, Oregon, Inisha, Shema E, Kathy Lindsay, Woye, Shaza E, Del Ecker, Wole. Uh, I am Andrew Ecker, my mother, Kathy Lindsay, my father, Dale Ecker, my mother's mother, Elva Gallegos, a Apache woman from New Mexico, my father's mother, Evelyn Beatty, Irish woman from Pennsylvania, my mother's father, Leroy Lindsay, Apache man from Arkansas, my father's father, Wayne Ecker, German Algonquin from Pennsylvania. I have a daughter, Bailey, a son, Peyton, a beautiful, beloved fiance, Monica. I was incarnated into this body in the land of the Multnomah in Portland, Oregon. Although I reside here in the land of the Akmal Atom in Phoenix, Arizona. So I'm grateful to be here with everyone listening to this uh, podcast. And today we are so privileged to get to know uh, a new friend to our community. And if you are new here, this is a space where we explore self identity, emotional intelligence, and relational spirituality. Uh, and I'm so privileged to have uh, Ashley Renee here with us today. Uh, to share some guidance, some hope, uh, some understanding into the great medicine work that Ashley is doing in the world. So I'll go ahead and turn it over here to Ashley. And if you'd like to introduce yourself, Ashley, that would be really great. Hi, yes. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for having me on today. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Ashley Renee. I um, I mostly work with women in doing deep trauma release. So trauma release of mind, body, and spirit um, from things from childhood, past lives, um, spirit attachments, just to kind of depending on what is there and, and what people are dealing with and sharing with people how to um, learn to navigate the language of their own emotions through how that manifests in the body, in the spirit, in the mind. Um, and with that, really allowing them to have a navigation system that is going to serve them to, to choose their desired reality instead of being overcome by a situation or a reality that they didn't exactly choose. Oh, I love it. What comes forward for me in that conversation is the idea of navigating emotions as energy, you know, mm -hmm. and this idea that we're in a state of cycles, you know, cycles with our emotions. And there's so many different ideas and concepts, especially floating out there in spiritual community. You know, oftentimes I'll hear terms like higher self, you know, or, um, my uh, spiritual self. And these concepts for me, they feel a little bit um, separating from this idea of the totality of the whole. Uh, can you give some insight into how we as people really begin to integrate maybe some of the behaviors that we would kind of label as our lower self or uh, lower vibrations, I guess, a lot of times people talk about. Yeah. So, and, you know, and I use those terms of, of, um, lower self, higher self, um, things like that. And reason being is because as a, as a sh like shamanic practitioner, I take people through the different worlds. So if we're diving into the past, we're going to go into the lower world and journey into that space to find the lower self or that space in which um, holds maybe all the, the negative beliefs, the things that are holding you back from being your full incarnation of your higher self or your, your Christ consciousness, if you will. Um, we all have the choice to step into our full power, but with the society that we have, um, you know, kind of grown up in, especially here in the U.S., I feel like a lot of our power has been suppressed in so many ways. And so it's really allowing people to know that it's that their emotions are safe for one. So um, fear could be considered one of those lower, denser vibrational energies that can kind of take you down. And if you stay in fear, you can go into depression, you can go into anxiety and, and, and different levels of, of those states of 
what I would refer to as lower vibrational energies or emotions. Now that doesn't exactly mean that they're bad. That just means that you feel denser or more heavy or maybe more negative with self-doubt, self-sabotage, you know, self-talk that's not um, conducive to rising yourself above. Um, And then you have your present self, you have your, your middle world self, this, this moment that we live in every single moment of every single day. And I think that a lot of people are actually stuck in the past or worried about the future and not truly in their present moment. And so when we talk about higher self, it's really allowing yourself to open up to the, the greater wholeness of everything allowing yourself to release expectations and attachments to what, you know, should be and allowing yourself to fully come into that space of your higher knowing. So instead of, you know, in a situation that might be challenging, instead of picking something that is, is going to be a comment or a invoke an emotion that's going to be self-sabotaging to that experience, you would connect with your higher self and and allow yourself to believe in yourself through that experience, if that makes sense. Mm, so you're saying that in the experiences of life, the the whole kind of, uh, I guess, multi diverse gamut of relationship to our emotions, that these frequencies that we would call lower uh these frequencies are a catalyst for allowing us to reach a space inside of our own relationship to self that can be integrative and can be beneficial to ourselves our community and our planet that's right yeah right and and as and you know i and again i work with mostly women but With women, I teach them to attune to their cycles. So one of the most common things is that, you know, most women will get told that um, during their periods, during their bleed time, that it's common to be over emotional, over sensitive, um, in pain, angry, frustrated, whatever it might be. But the reality of it is, is that your body is purging, not only physically, but it's purging everything mentally, emotionally, and spiritually as well. So if you can become aware of those things, then you don't have to ride the waves of, you know, PMS and and all of these other things that our society has told us is normal. And you can actually start to follow the language of your emotions and find out what your body is holding, find out what your aura is holding, your, your energetics are holding, and what you're physically manifesting into pain, into stress and overwhelm and, and all of these other things. So I think that, you know, a a big thing in order to integrate this is for people to really start coming back to their center and in the present moment and really asking themselves, what honors me in this moment? And not only what honors me on a spiritual level, but what honors my human? What does my human need right now? Because realistically, we can be as spiritual as we would like and, you know, do all the spiritual practices, do all of these amazing things that are going to project us forward in life. But the fact of the matter is, is we are human. Uh, you know, we're, we're a spirit having a human experience. And so to truly be present and journey in, in this realm, in this time, um, is, is so important for people as well. So with that said, the human experience I've found in my life has been uh, one that has been the greatest teacher, you know, the, the actual experiences of my upbringing, uh, where I grew up, how as a person who is now in my 40s, looking back at kind of the, the hand of providence, the hand of, of great spirit guiding me um, beyond this physical representation of self into um, what I would say is the eternal representation of my spirit. And I have found that there are so many likenesses in the spiritual journey with others that are called to this path. And with the, te- uh, the technology of ceremonial introduction, we're taught in our tradition, in Apache tradition and uh, Athabascan tradition, really, to identify oneself with the lands of our birth. And I just wanted to ask you, um, does that have any resonance with you? Are you in a space where 
you've recognized the idea of a connection to the lands of your birth, a connection to where you grew up in life? I have a connection to Mother Earth. It doesn't matter where I am on her, where I stand on her. She is the same no matter where you go. She is one of the few commons that we find no matter where we travel in this world. But I, and with that, I also, um, I view myself as a multidimensional being, which means I don't only resonate with the lands that I was born on, but I can remember past lives of planets and star systems I was born in as well. So for me to only um, say and, and, and do an introduction of self from this one space and homeland does not resonate with me because I am from everywhere. Yeah, we, uh, we definitely have this idea that there's an importance in recognizing where you're born. Um, and this is something that I've found in spiritual community oftentimes is that people will introduce themselves as a Palladian or as uh, an incarnation. And in the pragmatic sense of the indigenous teachings, there's this idea of really honing into the present honing into why we're born into this body, what were the, the teachers that came forward for us uh, in our practice. And for me, that's been, there's been a lot of resistance that's come forward, you know, in, in the acceptance of that. Um, for many years of my life, I was in a constant state of denying those teachers, denying uh, my parental teachers, denying my grandparents, even denying my heritage, you know, um, as an indigenous person, it's, uh, it's been a coming into that practice, you know, coming into understanding myself and understanding my indigenous language. And it is kind of a painful process, you know, at times, um, right, to just be stripped of all these egoic ideas of self identity. Um, you know, the, the imagination that we create around ourselves, it can be such an illusion, uh, that fosters this fortification of, um, I guess, uh, it's, it gives us an opportunity to be independent from our, our deepest trauma. You know, I can create a story around myself of being the Messiah, right? Uh, but yet I can't pay my rent. You know, I can create a story around myself of being the incarnation of a great Native American shaman, um, but I'm homeless, you know, uh, and I'm unable to even, you know, clean myself uh, effectively. You know, I've, I've ran into these kind of people in, in the world that, you know, are walking around with uh, with lice and with, uh, you know, just the filth of this idea of uh, this reality. But yet, you know, in their minds, they've created a storyline, you know, a story of being something uh, other than just a humble earthling. And for me, these indigenous practices, they really cut through the barrier of the illusion. And in that, we find a confidence in our sovereignty, you know, in the simplicity of being a sovereign being. Uh, and that for me is like sovereignty is defined as ultimate authority in our lives you know, being the ultimate authority over who we are, uh, which is like this choice of saying that I chose to be the son of two drug addict parents. I chose to be the son of, you know, a multi-racial individual uh, and really coming to grips with that um, and be finding comfort in it as well. So in that guidance that you create in the clients that you work with, when you're dealing with a person's past trauma, um, let's say, for instance, uh, sexual abuse or um, physical abuse, neglect, have you found that there's a tendency to create storylines that divert or spiritually bypass uh, those places of density within a person's, um, I guess, energetic body? Um, so I'm going to say with the clients that I work with, if you are working with me, you are no longer bypassing. Um, if you are still bypassing, I'm not the therapist for you. 
Reason being is because we dive to the depths of what is painful and we uncover all of it to be able to become aware of what is truly there, accept what happened, find the, the freedom again to know that your fear is safe. And, you know, most people don't like going back into their trauma because it's, it is painful and it scares them. Um, and so to really go back into someone's traumas is a very delicate process, but we, the way I work with clients is to get them back into their body, to get them using their voice, to allow them to make movements and sounds that maybe weren't safe at the time of the trauma in order to rewire the brain and the central nervous system to actually start to reestablish a balance and a safety within so that they can develop a space within themselves to start to trust themselves with their own discernment and decisions again. Um, a lot of the time trauma is done to us and we don't really have a choice. So our power of choice is taken away. And people carry this on through experience after experience, thinking that they don't have a choice or that freedom to choose. And so the biggest thing that we work on is reclaiming that power of freedom, reclaiming that power of choice and knowing that, you know, going back to that present moment is that in every single present moment, you are safe. You have survived this far. And because you have survived and have always survived, you get to choose to thrive. And so with that, we work with, you know, rewiring what that storyline was around that trauma. And sometimes it takes some digging because at the time of the trauma that happened when you were seven years old, you created a storyline in your head to make yourself okay with what happened. And so, or you forgot about it completely and completely numbed yourself. And so we, you know, we uncover these things and we go back into them and, just by giving a safe space for someone to feel back into their traumas, they are able to come through them in a way feeling liberated and free and reclaiming their power of choice in each and every present moment to actually start to align with the frequencies of the future they want to call in. Yeah. And so what is the, what would you say is the pragmatic like concept of the freedom of choice? Like how is the application of that in our everyday life? How does that show up in relationships? Shows up in every moment. You have a choice in everything. Um, it, you know, for example, like I have, um, I'll just use this, uh, um, a new partner that I am dating and he's also dating a few other women, but it came to, you know, he was like, when this started, he goes, I don't want to hurt you. And so my choice in that was to step into that, but also to tell him that I am the only one that can give you that authority to hurt me. And I don't give you that. So, which means I have a choice in every single aspect of this relationship. So if there's something that he does or tells me that I don't like, I have a choice to tell him, I don't like this. And I get to also have the choice to stay in it or step out of it. Yeah, that's a powerful tool of understanding our sovereignty. Uh, once we come to that place of realizing that ultimately it is our decision, it's so liberating. Uh, and it's so, there's so much freedom in that uh, exploration of uh of life and relationships and the value that that we bring um to each other yeah i know that the um the idea of polyamorous relationships and really exploring that for many people it has become uh, a catalyst for i guess um detachment uh from a lot of emotional struggles and it's for me, you know, as a person who has been, I guess, uh, uh, a lifetime monogamous uh, or, uh, you know, been in multiple long term relationships. And, you know, I feel like I have a lot of like eagle medicine. You know, <laughs> I, uh, I definitely am the one partner kind of guy. Uh, it, it is like it seems like a path that is valuable to many. Uh, and it seems also as one that does take a lot of, of letting go of 
relational uh, expectations and um, relational concepts of uh, identity. Uh, we we definitely live in a world that the structure of relationships uh, is uh, kind of taught to us, you know, and and I feel that there are many examples in nature of both ideas uh, of of relational dynamic within polyamory and also within uh, you know the uh, monogamy one person one partner uh, concept. So yeah, it's nice for you to share that with our audience. Well, uh, and, see, and and I wouldn't even call myself polyamorous at all. Um, but I do believe in, in dating and, and dating does not mean that you are exclusive to any one person, unless you have predetermined that you can date 10 people. And that is not necessarily considered polyamorous. That is the fact you are dating. You are not committed to any of them. So if I am dating three different guys, I am, I am literally having fun with each of them in their own ways, conversation, you know, we go explore nature, whatever the thing is that we enjoy doing together. The way I view dating is one of, you know, our society has put love and dating in such a tight box that I think a lot of people have just, you know, broken free of it altogether and kind of become rebellious to what society has taught us about relationships. And I don't blame them. For me personally, I am so um, focused on my my work, um, how I serve people, how I serve our planet that I don't really have time for a relationship. I don't want somebody in my space all the time. So to have someone to come cuddle with and, you know, watch a movie or whatever um, that might be is nice to have that. But the way I view dating is that if you are dating, you know, say five different people, at some point, if you are meant to be exclusive with that person, then the rest of the, the people that you both are dating are just going to kind of fall by the wayside. And at the end of it, it will just be you two left. But that, I feel, is an organic way of, of building a beautiful connection and relationship without having to identify as anything, without having too many attachments or expectations towards what that relationship should look like. And you just allow it to organically form into something that flows beautifully for both of you. Yeah, it's uh, definitely the world of, of identifying a relationship. Uh, it's something that many people in this uh, in the world tend to stay away from because of so many cultural ideas and concepts. Uh, you know, my body, if I touch, if I, you touch my body in, in a certain way, that means that there's a level of commitment uh, to, to each other. And that definitely is something that uh, many uh, in our contemporary culture have let go of, especially with uh, this, you know, emergent, I guess, well, it's been around for many years, but cuddle therapy has been something that a lot of people have benefited from and it really has brought people to a place of finding their intimacy and finding their boundaries and finding um their no's uh their yeses their voice and i feel that uh as we grow and in a in a spiritual sense explore these avenues of really creating intimacy in relationships uh, it's something that is definitely worth exploring. Uh, just to be touched sometimes is like such a release of of fear, of um, lack of trust. Uh, trust it just establishes faith and intimacy um, in relationships, and it definitely fills a need uh, for a lot of people. And I feel that also a lot of individuals that are dealing with depression and dealing with the density of loneliness you know a, a cuddle puddle would be like a cure for that you know and i remember uh back in the 1900s <laughs> when i was out there uh involved in the underground scene and going to a lot of parties uh, there would be these massive cuddle puddles, you know, right by the speakers. And you would see, you know, youth 
uh, teenagers, you know, 20 somethings just like completely uh, meshed in this intimate expression of touch. And it felt like such a, a freeing environment, you know, especially for myself being a person that kind of grew up in a neighborhood uh, around, you know, gang culture and that whole scene uh, where, you know, it's not like you're supposed to cuddle with people, you know, you're supposed to be hard, you're supposed to be tough. And uh, seeing that was like a total transformation. And now it's come forward into a therapy um, where people are like getting certified as uh, cuddle buddies. <laughs> think that that's that's just rad you know uh it's really a, a a rad thing to to have out there in the world uh i feel like there's so many different opportunities that are coming forward in life and as you were sharing that you work with uh shamanic wisdom uh what are some of the tools that you found uh, inside of your practice that ha have really helped you loosen people from the trauma, loosen them from um, the density of suffering in their lives? Do you use sound? Do you use the drum? Is, are there any tools that you have available for you? And uh, also, um, have you gain knowledge with the use of those tools from uh, a specific teacher or a specific lineage uh, in your practice? So I'm going to answer the second one first. No, everything that I have remembered through the therapies that I currently do, especially with sound and um, vibration frequency, um, they've come from a deep remembering. I've, I've done them many lifetimes past. Um, it's a deep remembering of that's why my soul came back was to relay these ancient techniques and, and healings that most don't even remember that are there. Um, now with that, I, you know, I do have extensive uh, trauma therapy training and energy work and polarity therapy and Reiki and, and different things like this. But um, with the sound healing, um, that is one of the biggest tools that I use. And, and going back to the basics of breath work. So I, as a breath work facilitator, one of the biggest things that I have people do is return to their breath because that we have so many people walking around the planet, shallow, shallow chest breathing, where they're not even actually bringing in a full breath. They're actually just letting their body kind of automatically breathe, which really isn't benefiting them other than keeping them upright and alive. So returning them back to their breath is huge. And through a session, we can, we can focus just on breath work and it can move the traumas from their body and restructure the cellular DNA to reestablish balance within the entire system. Um, I do use sound healing a lot. I, I tend to use um, alchemy crystal bowls. I tend to use um, an ocean drum, which I absolutely love. So bringing back that element of water into the space of sound. So that frequency of of being in the womb, of being cleared and cleansed by water, um, returning back to the elements. Um, and I do use some drumming. Um, what I tend to use my drums for is to sing into them. So I, when I'm doing sound healing sessions, different languages channel through me. Languages I don't speak, but they channel through me at certain times. Um, and many of my clients who have experienced the sound healing to that depth. And when I'm singing and I'm speaking, um, their common comment, I guess is, is how I put that is that they feel that the, the sound and the frequency of the instruments mixed with my voice feels like it's drawing the trauma from their body. And so people will go into full convulsions and, and just shakes and screaming and crying and, and laughing and just different things as these traumas start to release themselves from their spots where they've been frozen in the body for no telling how long. Yeah, that um, the experience of channeling languages is one that I found in my life. Uh, it's probably like 19... I would say 94, 
uh, when I first experienced that. And it was during a drum circle. And I just started channeling these songs uh, through my body. And then I got, uh, I guess, a little bit of a religious education on the idea of speaking in tongues. And I started researching this and found that there are multiple different uh, traditions around the world that have some sort of representation of this, uh, of this, you know, people have commonly referred to it as a light language. Uh, you know, again, here speaking in tongues, there's a lot of different ways that um, or a lot of different labels that people put on that. But it's definitely powerful. You know, uh, it's a powerful experience as a person to be the channel. And also for those that are listening to uh, the tools that we're using uh in the healing practice it's something that i i don't often use in the hospitals you know we do a lot of work in hospitals so a lot of uh, psychiatric lockdowns and memory cares skilled nursing communities um, those kind of places and i don't really call upon that very often in those environments which i would say is more of my corporate work uh, but when i'm doing one-on-one -on -one sessions uh, or community healing where it's less restrictive, uh, I definitely will pull out those tools and use them. And uh, they're definitely powerful tools to have. Uh, in our tradition, in uh, the Athabascan language, the concept of being a medicine person, it's synonymous with being a singer. And those two words go together. They're like the same word, basically. So it's taught that you may be prescribed an herb or a sand painting or a dance, any of those uh, forms of healing, uh, but it always comes with a song. And I feel like the contemporary culture would be so much more powerful if our doctors sang our medicines to us. <laughs> Well, you it, know? I mean, it, it steps into that realm of you have to bring it there. You have to be comfortable because you are in that field and you do go into the hospitals and different things like that, like to step into your power fully and to bring it into those spaces, corporate or not. Yeah, um, it's, uh, you know, I often realize that it's not about me. You know, it's about yeah. the the people. And I listen to the sensitivity of the collective consciousness when I'm doing the work. And it's uh, it definitely there. There are times when you can give an energy to a person, and the container is is very challenged to hold the energy. Uh, and I know that in in my practice, the sensitivity to that is very important. Uh, it's very important to uh, limit what I'm giving to the people until they're ready to receive it. Now, I also realize that inside of that conversation that I'm the ultimate uh, authority for that, you know, to say that a person isn't ready for um, something is kind of egoic in a certain sense. Uh, yet I feel that the stewardship of the medicine that I carry is, is important. And um, we can cause harm, you know, at times if we give someone too much. Uh, that definitely is is apparent in the level of the use of psychedelics. Um, psychedelics uh, tend to unlock trauma, um, and sometimes they throw them upon the reality of an individual without them having the navigation system to really uh, understand and, and to uh, find their way through it. I feel like that's why since the dawn of cultural identity, we've had individuals that have helped people navigate those processes. And when we're using uh, voice vibration, when we're using breath, when we're using the tools of sound, uh, we're definitely stepping into the realm of accessing uh, the neural pathways that contain these uh, interdimensional spaces. Uh, we're opening up the uh, pineal gland, we're accessing points inside of consciousness that uh, as a steward, we uh, or I need to be aware of the capacity of the of the clientele. So working in a psychiatric lockdown, you know, there's definitely a level of responsibility that comes forward. And even in drug rehabs, you know, um, 
in my practice with working in uh, drug rehabilitation facilities, when me and my beloved are in there and we're doing these um, sessions, there's like such a, a need for security. And I know that both me and my fiance were both uh, trauma survivors, suicide survivors, uh, and intravenous, you know, former intravenous drug users. So I feel that the voice of, um, I guess, it would be, you know, peer support uh, that comes forward. That's the language that comes forward for me right now. Uh, and even saying something to the group like, uh, if you feel comfortable enough to close your eyes, it's okay. And if you can close your eyes for just five seconds, 10 seconds, and just give it a try, uh, you can grow in that opportunity to feel safe enough to close your eyes. And this was something that was never taught to me uh, when I was first coming into spiritual practice. You know, no one ever told me, you know, they would just kind of command me to close my eyes or they would say something like, you know, OK, let's all close our eyes and take a deep breath together. And as we go into this guided imagery, relax the body. And there really wasn't a precursor of, hey, if you're feeling afraid to close your eyes, I want you to know that it's OK and that this is a safe environment. And many people that have dealt with trauma and have dealt with generational trauma like myself, it's like, what, you know, what, what do you mean close my eyes? Like, I don't feel safe enough to go to the bathroom and you're going to tell me to close my eyes. Uh, it's like, it, it, it just doesn't make any sense, you know? So I want to go as deep as I possibly can in the trance myself. Uh, and I also am like in a place where I, I feel that, you know, no harm is best. Although I have like let go of a lot of, uh, my resistance to talking, you know, about what's going on interdimensionally. And that came from a work with a, um, with a life coach because I was talking to her about what I see inside of the interconnectivity to the density of energy inside of these, uh, basically hospitals, you know, each one of these are kind of a vortex for dense energy, for suffering, for loneliness. And when I tap into that loneliness and I tap into that essence, I'm able to break that up. And inside of that density, there's a lot of things that will come forward, interdimensional beings, uh, angelic beings. Sometimes people's faces will change. Uh, I'll see colors. I'll see sacred geometry. And as I was sharing this with this life coach, she was saying what you said. She was like, you know, you need to say this to the people you're working with. They, they'll they have no idea of how brilliant you are if you don't tell them. And who are you to uh, to not tell them what, you know, is really going on in the interdimensional space? So with that said, it was like the next moment, next circle I did was a bereavement group. And sure enough, I seen this skull on this young man's face when I was playing the gong. Actually, when Monica was playing the gong and I was in the meditation. So when she's playing the gong, the chimes in the Tibetan bowl, I'm oftentimes tapping into the energetic space, seeing in the interdimensional. And I seen this young man had a skull on his face. And afterwards, I asked, you know, what was going on with him. And he had basically woke up next to his mom who had overdosed on fentanyl. Um, and she was already dead in the hotel that they were staying. But while Monica was playing the gong, she was hearing the voice or he was hearing the voice of his mom. And he grabbed a hold of the therapist and said, are you hearing that? Are you hearing that? And she basically used the terminology, a psychological terminology of hearing the voice of your lost love or your, your transitioned loved one, uh, which doesn't come to mind right now. But she said that that was like a precursor in him being able to process grief that he wasn't able to do prior to that. So he had no indicators of processing his grief during this three day or I'm sorry, it was a week uh, retreat that they had hired us to do sound healing at. And because he had that indicator, it was a huge moment of relief for the entire staff. So I do realize that there are times when it is important to share 
what's going on in the interdimensional, what's going on in the energetic. And it's like, you know, listening to the guidance, I guess, is probably one of the most important parts of the process. So, yeah, I'm very grateful for your share today. And is there anything else that you would like to you know, give to the audience, maybe your contact information, uh, where we can reach you. Uh, do you do online sessions at all or is everything in person? I do both. Um, I do a lot of retreats. So I do both women's and co-ed retreats. Um, they are embodiment retreats for releasing deep trauma. Um, I have an all women's retreat coming up in Sedona in May. And it is um, based around healing and releasing inner childhood trauma. So, and then I have another one coming up in August, which is also going to be in Sedona, Sedona. That is um, around the idea of masculine embodiment and feminine empowerment. And so these, you know, I, I go back and forth between retreats and one-on-one -on -one sessions and, um, and I also have a mentorship program to teach others how to do this type of work, how to be the space, how to do the backside uh, work of retreats and workshops and, and all of this stuff that I had to learn, you know, kind of the hard way and, and by fault and, you know, learning all the obstacles. Um, and that, you know, and the biggest thing that I help men and women with is, is being able to feel safe again. Um, whether that's with themselves, whether that's around other people, whether that's, you know, using their voice or, or having physical touch, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, um, finding that sense of safety again. And so, yeah, I can be reached, um, on Instagram, uh, Ashley underscore Renee underscore Hall. Um, and then you can also look me up on golden alchemical coaching and therapy, LLC.com. And so it's got a lot of my, my services and different things there. Um, and this will definitely be in the notes of the podcast as well. So one thing that comes forward that I'd like to explore, uh, when you were talking about the femininity and masculinity, um, and maybe you could just give us a brief, cause I know we're probably close to time. Uh, but just this understanding when we talk about masculinity and femininity, especially with everything that's going on in the world right now, uh, there's this ancestral wisdom that these are non physical binding energies. And when, a I feel like our contemporary culture within the patriarchy has done a real disservice to um, the value of the energies of femininity and masculinity. And could you kind of unpack that conversation a little bit for us, especially since you're hosting a retreat on those energies? How does the process of embracing your femininity as a man or your masculinity as a woman, how does that show up in the work that you do? I mean, so it's a process of of breaking down old constructs and unlearning as much as remembering. Um, and so a lot of women in today's society go around with a very masculine construct of how they should be always doing something in order to survive um, versus really surrendering into and leaning into the softness of their feminine and allowing the flow to come through. Um, the same with, you know, men have been taught to be strong, be tough, you know, um, don't cry, don't show emotion, you know, different things like this. And, and while the masculine has a very, very primal energy about it, it also is that, that surrendering into that vulnerable space of it's okay to have emotion. It's okay to show exactly what you're feeling. And so bringing these two things together within everybody, I don't care whether you are a female or a male identified in physical form, the feminine and the masculine energies are within us all. And so within the retreats, within my one-on-one -on -one sessions, teaching people how to truly embrace these again, you know, so for example, just because I am woman, I'm, I'll speak on that a little bit, but the, the, the woman's cycle, you know, 
our seasons cycle in and out through from spring to winter. So a woman's body and emotions also cycles just like that every single month going through death and rebirth. And so when we can tune into the natural cycles that are, we find that, you know, during premenstruation and menstruation, we're in our autumn and our winter months, but we're also more feminine. We're more rest and, and relax and rejuvenate versus when we go into that space of, you know, the maiden within our pre-ovulation and the mother within ovulation, that's actually a more masculine, like front energy of, of we're ready to bring our energy into the world. And so learning how to combine these two energies within every bit of every person allows for a balance to come through that can significantly shift your whole life and the way things flow so that you're not having to force or push things, you know, by doing or trying so hard. Oh, that's awesome. <clears throat> Are you familiar with uh, Sabrina Vedette and um, Sacred, I think it's Sacred Yoni, um, Sacred Lotus Yoni? Uh, she does these... Um, steam i think it's steam cleanses and they're based on like ancient principles of um of the yoni steam uh from around the world and she's developed this whole practice around that i just feel like when you were talking for for whatever reason she came forward and i would love to connect the two of you um i think that there's some energies there that maybe the two of you could explore together in your practices yeah, it's such a huge conversation right now, you know, with all this work that's coming um, or all this energy and anger that's coming forward in the legislation around transgender and uh, gender roles and identity. It's like we could learn so much from these ancient wisdoms of really the fluidity of masculine and feminine. And as we apply that knowledge base to our contemporary culture, uh, it lets us find that sovereignty and freedom and lets go of the fear of really, um, I, I, I feel of femininity or masculinity from both fronts. Uh, there is a lot of fear and a lot of disconnect from those energies. I like to say that we operate from a trinity, ultimately, that is the natural journey of life. And this trinity is sacred child, feminine, masculine. And if you think about the geometry of the triangle, it's really the strongest form of sacred geometry. It's one of the foundational forms of, of building blocks of the universe. So the natural journey of child feminine, masculine, really brings forward these energies of such power in, into our lives. Child being the place of faith, the place of courage, uh, the place of limitless um, trust, uh, the feminine being that nurturing side of ourselves. That's the cycles of life. You know, we think about Mother Earth. We look at her mountain and she dresses in her spring wardrobe, her fall wardrobe, her winter wardrobe and her summer wardrobe. And this reminder of the cycles within our human self is so important. And then the masculinity, which is more of the linear, right? It's point A, point B, you know, getting through a process of linear understanding, you could say logical understanding in itself. Uh, that really kind of uh, in the space of the emotional intelligence of the feminine, which is really about cycling through emotional process and then balanced by the power of the sacred child. Uh, it's really such a wonderful way of relating uh, to self and relating to the world around us. And we're reminded all the time, right? Because we have Mother Earth, Father Sky, and then us in the middle, which is the child. Uh, and then, of course, the process of birth, the process of life itself is just that natural journey of, uh, so, you know, I commend you and your work for balancing and reminding us how to be in process with the feminine and the masculine energies. Uh, and for so many people that are out there that are dealing with uh, the trauma of life, the trauma of this past year uh, that so many have gone through, loss, so many have gone through uh, financial burdens. I mean, there's just so many things going on. And then also seeing 
the magnification of white supremacy, the magnification of uh, the discord of distrust in our government. I mean, there's just so much as uh, as people living in this country that we need help processing. It's beautiful, uh, Ashley, to know that there are great practitioners out there like you uh, that can help us. And very proud of you for the work that you're doing and keep doing it, you know. And uh, if there's anything that the Sacred Seven community can do to support you, um, please reach out, you know, when you're in Sedona, if you need any uh, support uh, behind drums, we have about 150 instruments here. So uh, yeah, if you want to facilitate some kind of drum experience, let me know. We also have a trained facilitator in Sedona, Harta, that is definitely available to do uh, some amazing uh, compliments to your experiences. Uh, also, do you, you were saying a little bit about helping people navigate their own retreats. Is that what I was hearing from you? That you're doing some kind of business training um, in that space? Is that what you were saying? Um, so it's more of a mentorship program. So it's uh, it's inclusive of eight different retreats that they must attend in order to embody their own practices. And on the back side of that, there is one-on-one -on -one online virtual classes that I take them through all of the underworkings of how to put on successful workshops, retreats, how to do the marketing, the design, the, the ins and outs of what you're going to need and how to do it successfully. Um, the biggest thing there is, you know, stepping into the embodiment coaching that I do for embodied leadership. And that is really to allow them to feel confident in themselves to step into their medicine and share it with the world. Oh, it's fantastic. Okay, great. Well, it's been a really great conversation. And thank you so much for joining me here. And uh, I just like to give a little intentional offering here as I put down this cedar. And uh, if it's all right with you, I'd like to just share a little intention for you and your ministry. Uh, so Creator Source, I pray that you would bless Ashley, Renee, and all of the work that she does. I pray that you would move in the ancestral realms, the east, the south, the west, and north, and release the holy people uh, to do the work that needs to be done in order for this medicine to reach those that are out there in need. Beauty above, beauty below, beauty beside, beauty in front, beauty behind, beauty within. I am, we are made beautiful again. Blessings, my friend, and have a great day. And I hope that uh, good things come from your retreats. It sounds like you're going to have an amazing time in beautiful Sedona. Uh, it's a great place, you know, ancestral lands of the Apache people up there. So uh, very, very home feeling when I go to Sedona. All right, Ashley, have a great one. You too. Thank you.